And up next, we have another good friend of mine. He's a former combat veteran of the United States Marine Corps. He's passionate about helping veterans in distress. Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend, Mr. Ron Self. Hello. Thank you. I got to say, I just got to pet a dog for the first time in 19 years, and I'm feeling some kind of way about that. OK, here we go. November 9th. 2011, a regular day just like any other day. I walked into my cell, stepped up on the toilet seat, put a rope around my neck, attached it to the locker, and stepped off. About an hour and a half later, I woke up on the floor. The rope had broke, which surprised me um, because I made the rope. It was a, out of a sheet, a four braid rope, soaked it in water, real good tensile strength. Probably made a hundred of those in the Marine Corps, towed Humvees with them. But this one broke. Okay. Initially what I felt was twofold. Shame for having attempted to kill myself and shame for having not succeeded. And while I'm not a religious man, at some level I felt the rope broke for a reason. Or maybe I just wanted to believe it broke. Okay, so I figured I'd sit with that for a while. About two weeks later, I was in a prison university project, English 204 research class. The end result being to produce a 15 to 25 page paper on the topic of your choice. It was the beginning of the semester and someone handed me a document. And keep in mind, I didn't tell anyone I tried to kill myself. Nobody knew that. And so someone handed me this document and what it was was a legal opinion filed by Judge Reinhardt of the Ninth Circuit Court, September 2000, nine in response to a lawsuit filed by the family of a veteran who committed suicide. In his response, he cited a CATS suicide study, which indicated that 18 veterans a day were committing suicide at that time. Throughout the course of the semester and then months to follow, I went on to discover something that I found incomprehensible. And that is in the 14 years from the start of the Iraqi war to include the Afghanistan war, 6,855 American personnel were killed in action. In that same period of time, 73,000 veterans committed suicide. Now when I share these statistics, these numbers with people, they think I must be mistaken. I'm in prison, we don't have access to good information, but we actually, in the college program, we have real good access to a lot of literature to do the research. And that's an accurate number. And I went on to discover a few other things. And that is that I don't know why that number's so high. I can only speak for a small percentage of it. So that's what I'm gonna talk about right now. And when I explain that to people, what I ask them to understand is that the relationship forged between men in combat is similar to that between a parent and a child. And for a veteran, there is no greater loss than that of a brother in combat. To actually see him fall. And the biggest lie of your life, you tell to yourself the rest of your life, that being you could have done something different to alter that outcome. And you simply couldn't. And while you saw them fall, you know they're gone. They're not really gone. Because every night when you close your eyes, you see their faces in the shadows of your dreams. Constant reminders of the brotherhood, of the camaraderie, of the family you search for the rest of your life, but intuitively know you'll never find. Now, friends and family, they try to span that emotional divide. They try to bridge the gap. But it's, it's pointless. I mean, they may as well look up to the stars and try and talk to people in a distant galaxy to talk to you. And that's because serving with men that died by your side, sometimes in your arms, proving their worth to you has rendered pre-war family and friends untrustworthy, undependable. Translation, there's a stranger among us. That stranger's the veteran. It's me. So clearly the seeds of suicide, in my opinion, are planted on the battlefield. And they remain dormant 
for the most part, while you're on the battlefield. Only now your tour of duty's up and it's time to rotate back home or you get injured. Either way, you're coming back home. And that's where they start to grow. From the second you step foot on that plane and arrive at the very same airports that our brothers and sisters from Vietnam arrived at and were greeted by people calling them names like baby killer, murderer, war criminal, go away. We don't want you in our country. I gotta say America gave itself a real good ass kicking in how it treated Vietnam veterans. Only now it's 45 years later in this generation of veterans from the Gulf War, Iraq, Afghanistan, and a dozen other places you've never heard of are returning home and they're arriving at those very same airports. And it's become an opportunity for those people that gave the Vietnam veterans such a hard time to redeem themselves. It's become an opportunity for America to redeem itself in relation to how it treats its veterans. And so we step off the plane. People are waving flags. Welcome home, you're a hero, we love you, we're so proud of you. And while many of the Vietnam veterans would have appreciated that type of reception, they, and this is the hard part, as this generation of veterans knows, there's some truth to those insults. You see, many of the things that happen in combat simply do not translate into being a hero. Yet you come back and everybody's saying, you're a hero, we're so proud of you. And so we come back and that's all we ever wanted was to make it back. And now that you are back, you've never felt so alone. You've never felt so much guilt and shame in your life. Now you just wanna go back and you won't have to worry about thanking people for thanking you for your service. You won't have to worry about feeling like you're alienating people. And that's just what you do, you alienate everybody around you. And there's a reason for that, because if you let anybody in, if you let anybody get close, you might lose them. And the thought of losing anyone else just brings you back to losing your brothers in combat. And for many veterans, it's just just you can't go back to war and you can't go forward or you feel like you can't go forward, the easiest solution for many is just to chamber around and drop the hammer. That's what many do. Another option, clearly my option, is I came to prison. It's just coming to prison is a different path to the same destination, death. It's just a slower path. Only for me, as you know, the rope broke. And when the rope broke, a solution appeared to me. And in 2012, I founded Veterans Healing Veterans from the Inside Out. And in it, what I believe is the solution to the problem of the high rate of suicides. Now, it's really simple, as some things in life are. When you join the military, it's understood that you have to graduate boot camp to go on and be a member of that branch of service. If you think of society as a branch of service, which it is, Before you can return to it from the military, you have to complete boot camp out. To not implement boot camp out and have veterans complete it, in my opinion, is the equivalent of bringing a 60 ton Abrams tank back from war, painting it yellow, slapping some stickers on it, and calling it a school bus. That's not gonna work out too well. I mean, can you imagine this big yellow Abrams tank cruising down the street, leaving a wake of torn up asphalt, crushed cars behind it, It's not trying to do that, it's not trying to be destructive, but it's a tank, it's a weapon of war. Well, when the veteran comes back from war, it's the same thing. For that tank to be a school bus, clearly some changes have to be made. And that's what boot camp out's about, it's about making those changes. Now, boot camp in, first thing you do in the morning is you strap on your combat boots, put your rucksack on, check your weapon, make sure it's sighted in, good to go. Boot camp out's the opposite of that. First thing you do in the morning is you put on your flip-flops, your board shorts, baseball cap. Daily exercise begins with yoga, meditation, maybe a few laps in the pool, mountain bike riding. Definitely not a backpack carrying an M16. The heart of the program would revolve around narration therapy. Now most veterans, myself included, will tell you, I don't need to write my experiences of war down. I live them, they're forever burned into my memories, etched into my soul. But there's something about writing them down. They're tangible now. You can hold them, look at them, relate to them in a different way than just thinking about them. And we share those experiences with other veterans that have similar experiences. Something starts to happen, something unexpected, something that you didn't think could ever happen again. You start to feel a connection. You start to feel alive. And you learn that it's okay 
to take one step out of the shadows of denial and depression. And it's okay to share those repressed and subdued memories. And every time you do that, every time you share that with another group of veterans, it gets easier. It has for me. Now, the program I speak of will be unprecedented in military history, in history, because it doesn't exist yet. There is no boot camp out. There never has been. Now, the powers that be will say, oh, we're doing plenty. We're, we're, we're addressing the problem. We have programs in place. And I would say it's evidenced by the high rate of suicide, the 73,000, that those programs are ineffective. Now, in the military, it's all about the chain of command. So the orders come from the top down. Being here in prison, San Quentin, I couldn't be any farther away from that chain of command. And that's why I need your help. We need people of power and influence to help make this program happen. Without people of power and influence, this program won't exist. Now, America claims to love and support its veterans. I say prove it. We ask that you use your power, your influence, to advocate for a change in how veterans re-enter society. Advocate for this change. I would ask you to contact Veterans Healing Veterans from the inside out to find out what you can do, what more you can do to help us save our brothers and sisters, your brothers and sisters, your sons and daughters from a fate that's undeserving of them and their service to this country. And one other thing, it's not often that people from all walks of life can actually make history. And this is what this is. It's an opportunity for everybody here, everybody in blue, everybody that's coming from the street, everybody that hears this message to get involved and make boot camp out happen. We already have a version of it here at San Quentin Prison. And we have, of course, it's a smaller scaled down version. Um, I don't think I can convince the warden to put a pool in, <laughs> but it's a very successful program that we have here. And we, uh, we have several veterans that have paroled from San Quentin, and they're thriving. So we have a good idea of what to do and how to do it. We just need your help to do it. So before I leave, so all I'm going to say is that uh, I'm just asking for your help. Thank you.